This is the last session of the day, I'm told. I was just listening intently to the previous session about trackability and a whole lot of those things which uh, really pertain to the industry that we all belong. And I can tell you this uh, topic that we have for the last uh, panel discussion is something that will set you thinking and hopefully set you thinking sustainably. Uh, that, that's what we would like to do over the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. It is my privilege and responsibility to anchor this session, which is about ESG and sustainability in logistics. Uh, I'm Suresh, I work for All Cargo Logistics. I look at portions of our India business. Uh, I also look after the ESG portfolio for the group uh, globally. And uh, the fellow panel members, I will, during the course of the conversation, uh, request them to say a couple of lines about the businesses that they do but I will lead you uh, into that. So when we hear about sustainability, uh, it's very clear uh, what sustainability means. It is uh, the ability to meet our needs without compromising the needs of the future generation. That's the most simple definition of sustainability that one can come across. And this encompasses uh, natural resources, economic resources, and social equity. When we talk about all this, where does logistics and transportation stand? We all know, and it's widely acknowledged, that logistics and transportation is the backbone of the economy, supports industry and commerce, generates a lot of employment, and therefore economic growth of many countries is linked to how well logistics uh, performs as a sector. Along with all these good connotations and attributes, there are always a few questions which pop up. Is something called sustainable logistics even possible? Is sustainable logistics an oxymoron? When we talk about logistics, we talk about typically asset-heavy industries. We talk about the unorganized sector. So what is this sector's view about digitization? What is this sector's view about diversity and equity and inclusivity? What is this sector's view about carbon neutral, water positive, and all those things? So to answer a lot of those, I think we have got a wonderful panel here today, which straddles multiple industries. So you've got Sanjay Kare, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Skoda Volkswagen. Uh, you've got Arham, uh, who, who is from the New Age uh, companies, who has developed a marketplace for trucking. Uh, we have Hakimuddin, who represents uh, Dalmia Cements and who's had a glittering career before that with the Tatas. And then we have uh, Suresh, my namesake, who is in another very, very important industry, if you were to call it, which is agriculture. We never see agriculture as an industry, but I think finally we all would like to have a good meal at the end of the day, and therefore agriculture is very, very important. So it's a panel which straddles multiple industries. I had an opportunity to talk to all of them the last couple of days. And the amount of insights that I picked up from them, their experience, their expertise is truly uh, across a wide spectrum. And that is what I will try to bring to you during the next 30, 45 minutes. Just as a teaser, let me leave a few things to you. Till I spoke to Sanjay, car meant a four-wheeler automobile to me. But I think Sanjay will have a very different view of what CAR stands for. Arham spoke to me about how in logistics or logistics with technology could be the new, new UPI in our country. And he also talked to me, and I'm sure he will talk to us about a very interesting concept called Evolve. Hakimuddin, uh, he kind of blew my mind when he said that their organization is now the third largest cement manufacturer in the country, but they also have the lowest carbon footprint amongst their peers. So that was very, very good to know. And then when Suresh spoke to me uh, about the vision of Bayer, he is from Bayer, he talked about food for all, hunger for none, which I think is truly inclusive, truly talking about sustainability for the future. So in my conversation, I was truly uh, what, what would I say, uh, impressed, amazed, awed 
by the amount of work that they have done in their careers and their organizations are currently doing. And we will bring a slice of that to you this evening. Starting with Sanjay, I would request you to kick this off for us talking about ESG and sustainability. Thank you, Suresh. And I'm really impressed the hard work that you did with us yesterday and how you brought us on board together. And I think, I think we already done our discussions yesterday itself. So I think uh, it's a bonus for us that we are talking and meeting once again today. Really, really very enlightening to talk on this topic of sustainability. But before I talk on this topic, I want to listen to a story from someone in the audience. I think we have all listened to Aesop's fables. And there was a story called a goose who laid golden eggs. How many have listened to the story? Has anyone listened to the story? So can somebody recount that story in a minute? I don't recollect the complete story, but I'll say as much as I remember. Yes. Please. Uh, yes. What the one fellow was lucky enough to get a goose which lays golden eggs, but uh, he was cute because it was laying only one egg a day. He didn't have the patience. He wanted to know how many eggs is inside. He cut the goose and finally he stopped you know, getting the golden egg. So that's wonderful. Sir, what's your good name? Prem Kumar. Prem Kumar, please I clap for him. <laughs> so that beautifully summarizes the story of our sustainability. This earth is limited and we have to recognize the businesses, whether we're into manufacturing or into logistics or into consulting, everywhere you have to recognize that a good business, I think I've got a definition which I've written over here, I'll try to read it out. Long-term business success can be achieved only by companies that recognize that the economy is an open subsystem of Earth's ecosystem, which is finite, non-growing, and materially closed. Earth is limited. Our resources are limited where we talked about hen. Who can this hen be standing for? Or this goose be standing for, which was cut for taking the golden egg? What does it stand for? Anybody? Earth. What more connotations? Resources. What more? People. Wonderful. Logistics is very badly dependent upon our own people. So this is where we have to see that we have to do those good businesses where we are not tapping into finite resources, but we are tapping into an, an infinite resource. We have got one infinite resource. What is that? Sun. Sun. Sun is an infinite resource to us. Human thinking is an infinite resource to us. In innovations are infinite resources to us. There is just people say that only 7% of human mind is utilized. That means only 7% of innovations have happened. Much more can happen, which I think Aram and others we'll talk about. So this was the basics around that we have to basically, what uh, definition Suresh also said that ultimately we don't have to kill the golden goose or we have to basically working so that our future generations do not work, do not ch get challenged about the resources that we have used from their share. Uh, and uh, one more thing, there's a word called intergenerational conflict. I think this also which comes from this definition of sustainability. There's also intragenerational con uh, conflict. So if you are using electric vehicle and a lithium battery into that, which has been mined in Congo and in Congo there have been human rights violations. So this is a intergenerational conflict, not intragenerational intra conflict. So we have to take care of these points. Uh, I belong to automotive industry. I'll very quickly tell about what we have done. We have done a total GHG emission of our inventory. Uh, inventory of the entire GHG emissions right from resource extraction to supply chain. That part takes around 13%. 2% is our in-house manufacturing, 80% in the use phase of the car, and last 5% is in the uh, disposal of the car. This entire value chain, we have committed that by 2050, we'll make it zero. In the entire value chain, right from resources till recycling, it will be absolutely zero emissions, or either zero impact on the environment and society around us. Uh, we are working very fast on our manufacturing programs. Our plants are already more than 30% carbon neutral in Pune, 100% in Aurangabad. 100% green energy is used in Aurangabad plant. Pune plant has got 18 and a half megawatts of solar power. That means 30% of energy comes from the sun, which was the infinite resource talked about. We are a zero waste plant. When whatever our wastes are there, we are able to re reduce, recycle, reuse, and repurpose it. 
More than 99.5% of waste are diverted away from the landfill. We are a zero liquid discharge company, means whatever amount of waste uh, water we generate, we are able to recycle, reduce it, repurpose it, and use it for gardening inside. And uh, we are a water positive company also. That, that means whatever amount of water we use inside, more than 14% of that we are able to conserve in the societies around us, or we are able to do the rainwater harvesting. So all this is all about the our efforts to minimize the negative impacts on the environment. Ultimately, we are there to give a sustainable mobility to the world. Coming to the logistics part, all of our inside plant warehouses, whatever logistics we are having, 100% electric vehicles we are using, 100% electric forklifts, tow trucks. In-plant movement is 100% electric. I am from a Skoda. A Skoda encourages cycling. It's a car maker which started as a cycle maker way back in 1891. I'm a cyclist, endurance cyclist, and we encourage cycling for all our employees. We go at least once a week to our offices on cycle. Uh, it's almost uh, 50 kilometers both ways, but we do. So uh, that's one thing because we say that's a symbol of uh, sustainability. Now, uh, Suresh said that I have to define something known what car is. Uh, car certainly is automobile, but for me, I use the word C-A-R, car. So sustainability, everything starts with taking a commitment, C, that I commit that I will minimize the waste. I commit that I'll start using renewable energy. I commit that by this date, it will happen. And lovely, what I found out that everything was a big saving of money upon us. The time I switched to renewable energy, instead of 8 rupees a unit, I'm paying 3 rupees 60 paisa a unit. 60% hoping 25 crores a year I'm saving on only on energy cost. If I'm going to zero waste, I'm saving upon 25,000 rupees per ton on disposal cost of waste. If I'm becoming a zero water uh, discharge, that means whatever water I was buying for gardening, I, it's becoming free for me. So much of positive impacts and so much of uh, positive connects we have generated with our employees, with our customers on this topic. Our vehicles are the vehicles in the market which are already compliant with the E20 fuels, the new fuel which is getting launched, which is 20% biodiesel and biofuel. We are vehicles already compliant with that. So this is our bit on this. So C was about taking commitment that we will do it. A is about taking actions, defining actions and taking actions. And R is about the results, measurable results, achievable results. But this journey doesn't stop here again. I can say car square. So once you have done the CAR first cycle, second cycle again starts about C stands for communication. Next, A is about raising the ambitions to global ambition to become an absolute zero ambition. And then what we achieve is R called resilience. And this resilience is equal to 1.5 degrees centigrade maximum global warming. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay, for really setting the context uh, for the whole discussion. In fact, the, the, the panel discussion which preceded us uh, talked a lot about resilience. And you were talking about that as a second phase of CAR. So we'll come to that as we uh, build our conversation. So it is said that uh, the secret of change uh, is to focus uh, all our energy in not fighting the old, but in trying and creating the new. And the true embodiment of that is what uh, Arham does with technology and innovation. And if you could talk to us about how you're using technology and innovation to improve sustainability in logistics, it will be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Suresh ji, uh, for the wonderful introduction uh, and uh, making me the part of this esteemed panel. Um, to uh, very humbled by the experience of you know uh, Sanjay ji, Suresh ji, uh, and everybody in, uh, you know my co-panelist. So uh, we started Trucknetic with a single mission that you know uh, anything that we're going to start would not be just primarily focused on profits. Any company we believe is the company which kind of addresses triple bottom line. Profit is just one element of that. Every company that we'll see in the future would have triple bottom line profits. Definitely, it's important for companies to grow. But social impact is the second one, and the third is environmental impact. And that was one of the you know key insights that we had before we started the company. Uh, Trucknetic is a very young startup, four year old. Uh, it's India's first truck booking marketplace redefining the way loads move with a touch of a button, where our vision is to uh, reduce the cost of freight of logistics, uh, you know, which is around 14% of GDP as of now, to a single digit 7%, and doing it sustainably, uh, sustainably by achieving net zero emissions. 
So what we are doing is basically, uh, you know, trying to create an asset light model. We already have close to 12 million trucks in the country, uh, and the market is very unorganized and fragmented. Uh, you know, where 95% of the fleet owners own less than three trucks. So rather than us putting in more trucks into the picture, we figured out how can we leverage the existing infrastructure that we do have in terms of assets. Uh, the asset utilization today is less than 50%. At any given point in time, out of 12 million trucks that we do have in the country, more than 50% of the trucks are either stranded or, uh, or moving without loads. So that's where we have built the platform, Trucknetic, where we are creating uh, entire digital platform, uh, reducing the manual intervention to zero, a single platform where anybody can book a truck in less than 30 seconds. We, uh, in the last four years, uh, happy to kind of share that we have been able to kind of amass a network of close to a million trucks, which is one twelfth of the entire fleet, where we are not positioning ourselves as transporters, but we are a platform where we are enabling and empowering all the stakeholders involved into trucking. So that's the idea. And that's where we are trying to kind of uh, solve the trucking problem. But as I've mentioned that, you know, uh, company has also two other initiatives, you know, uh, if it has to be a successful company, which is environmental and social impact. And that's why we started off along with starting Trucknetic, a platform called What the Truck, registered as a Section 8 company, nonprofit organization, Highway Heroes India Foundation, where we are helping our small fleet owners and drivers, 360 degrees, not just providing them the loads, but also helping them out in you know multiple different uh, sort of you know problems that they're grappling with. One is you know their identity. You know most of the truck drivers are today called by their vehicle number, not by names. It's a thankless job that they have been doing. What they have been able to do for us during COVID is, I mean, like we have to be so you know grateful for them. I think they were meticulously driving during those lockdowns where we were sitting at homes during our lockdown. Uh, getting those essentials, basic essentials, pharmaceuticals, oxygen, and so on and so forth, where even the dhabas were closed, but they were managing the transportation. So that's where we are helping our truck driver community uh, because that is one of the key stakeholders for any trucking company for logistics to survive. And that's one of the assets which is neglected in our country, and uh, that's what we have been trying to. Um, our initiative can be a mere catalyst where a lot more players needs to come in along with the government of India to kind of take it as a priority. Otherwise, uh, we definitely are seeing that there's gonna be a huge shortage of drivers. And the third thing, uh, which uh, Suresh Ji was uh, mentioning, we recently, uh, it's about six months, launched this platform under Trucknetic umbrella called Evolve. Evolve stands for moving towards better future, but sustainably, gradually. And that's what our aim is, to kind of you know make trucking from what it is using as a fuel like diesel, uh, which are CD CRDI engines or CNG to sustainable, you know, vehicles, which is EV using uh, hydrogen as a fuel, and so on and so forth. Uh, see LNG as well, which I I believe uh, Japan and China are doing a great job, where they have uh, sort of uh, changed their fuel, uh, particularly uh, for heavy duty trucks to LNG. So Evolve is a platform where we are uh, creating an ecosystem for EV commercial vehicles to thrive where we are working with multiple stakeholders, OEMs. There are a lot of OEMs coming in, trying out, but they are not becoming successful because of one reason, because they are not able to kind of, you know, sell their vehicles. They are kind of, you know, providing them on lease and rental model. And that's one of the challenges for them to do more innovation to kind of become OEMs. So what we are doing is facilitating them to kind of sell their vehicles with the network that we do have of vendors. We are also helping them to increase asset utilization uh, by a kind of, you know, uh, providing them with more loads, uh, which is both B2C and B2B in nature. So that's where we are creating an entire ecosystem where we would want the transition to kind of pick up, where uh, not just uh, one stakeholder, which is OEMs, but everybody involved in the ecosystem would move towards uh, sustainable vehicles, move towards EV vehicles. Thank you. That was a comprehensive update about what you've been doing over the last uh, few quarters and years in terms of uh, bringing the trucking marketplace. Uh, there are a few questions that I'm sure will be there from the audience about uh, the electric portion that you talked about. We'll come, we'll come to it uh, as we build the conversation. I would now like to kind of uh, talk about uh, sustainability from a point of view of how it used to be looked at in the past, saying that sustainability is all about doing less harm to the environment. I think that thought process is slowly changing. 
and it is now starting to focus on how do I do more good for the environment, how do I do, go, do, do more good for society. And listening to uh, what Suresh uh, talked to me about what Bayer does, I think it's a true reflection of this change in thinking. It is about doing more good rather than concentrating on doing less uh, difficult things. So Suresh, if you could just talk to us about some of the initiatives that you have at Bayer, that will set the tone for us. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, as you mentioned that uh, in the agriculture industry, which is a very uh, new to this audience, basically, I just wanted to uh, introduce that uh, I'm Suresh Pasrich. I'm representing Bayer Group. Bayer is a German uh, multinational company, like a worth of uh, business 42 million uh, euro. So we are having 83,000 employees with across the world. And our footprints are more than 130 countries as well. So looking at uh, the uh, carbon emission on the sustainability point of view, we took a lot of initiatives. Uh, though it's an agriculture company, we are like depending on the logistics like uh, because of the perishable and the live products which where we are dealing with, like uh, seeds and traits and also the crop protection products and also the uh, technology in terms of uh, providing the solution to the customer service and also on the environment solutions kind of things. So. <clears throat> We uh, initiated a uh, few of the things in last three years. First, we have uh, optimized our warehouse network. That was the technology-based uh, solution, like a Llama Soft kind of uh, term technology we have used to have the best infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, logistic uh, so infrastructure and also safety point of view as per the global uh, government guideline as well as the buyer internal HSE guidelines. That way, we have reduced 35% of warehouses that has not only helped us to uh, less, uh, like a free uh, miles to run on the road, one, and second was definitely the cost, and thir third was the cost uh, service level, which we have really uh, improved by 8% to our 6,000 active customers across India. And second uh, initiative we have took that, uh, because of this, our live uh, products which we are running with, uh, why not to opt and approach uh, the direct shipment to the customers? And that has helped us to reduce the secondary transportation activities where our material was flowing from mother warehouse factories to the secondary warehouses, then to the uh, customers. So we have uh, escaped the secondary transportation activities for our 35% uh, volumes, which has helped uh, like uh, uh, almost 21%, 24% of the carbon emission uh, less. 3,000 plus trucks moved less on the road and also a lot of uh, uh, cost saving, uh, which has really helped to the organization in both the ways and to the environment. And third, one uh, third initiative, which is very, very imp uh, important in the agriculture industry, Bayer as a leader took the lead uh, to uh, transport the material, uh, seed material basically to the Bangladesh via rail mode. We know that uh, how the uh, trucks and the combination of the uh, carbon emission is having C, uh, trucks, train, and the uh, uh, air. So we opted the train. Almost 6,000 metric ton we have export to the train, and 66% carbon emission was less generated uh, to the environment. That has helped in our lead time. That has helped in carbon emission. That has helped huge cost saving as well. Beyond this, Bayer is also committed, uh, as you touched upon, uh, health for all and hunger for none. We are into pharma. Uh, industry, healthcare, and also the crop science, we are providing the crop solution to the farmers. It is not only the product, but complete crop solution. We are into preventive and cure uh, medicines. We are supporting the everyday health to the, uh, all, the, all the human beings, and also ensuring our best products uh, to feed the growing population across the world. That way we are committed, health for all, hunger for none. Thank you. Excellent, excellent set of initiatives. And uh, there is a question that I have about methane, which I'll come to you later. But let me now go across to uh, Hakimuddin. And what comes to my mind is uh, what Einstein had said once, that problems cannot be so solved if the same level of awareness exists which created them. One needs to kind of change the way in which you look at things if you are to kind of come up with solutions. And while describing his journey over the last few years, Hakimuddin talked about how uh, he took the reins of Dalmia Cement at a time in which there was a turnaround which was required. 
and how that was made possible, which means the company grew at an impressive pace, along with a sharp focus on sustainability. So the message for me listening to him yesterday was, growth and sustainability are not either or things, it can be done together. And who better to talk to us today on that than you who have really done this and some of the numbers that you shared yesterday, I would request you to talk to our audience also. Thank you very much, Suresh, uh, for this brief introduction. Uh, very briefly about me, I have been uh, in steel for about 18 years, in Tata Steel and then Tata Blue Scope Steel, and uh, in refractories uh, in Calrys for about 10 years, and currently with Dalmer Cement last three years. We had taken over a, a plant which was uh, non-operational for about seven, eight years. Our task was to revive it, bring it back to life, and set up the entire chain channel and, and, and ensure that, uh, that we start turning around this succulent. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, from day one when we decided to revive this plant, we already incorporated a huge amount of fundings. The total cost of revival was about 1,000 crores, but we had already built in, say, about 250 crores of investment, which was going into green technologies. And very briefly speaking, you know, um, Dalmia Cement's uh, journey has been a, a remarkable green growth journey. I think if you would have heard Probably we were the only company which were uh, led into Davos uh, and represented uh, through Prime Minister for uh, for committing that will be net zero by 2040. And that's a very ambitious target. I'm very happy to share that currently we are at the level of about 468 kg per ton of cement, CO2 emission, which is globally amongst the least cement. As a cement company, we are the least and global average is 600. So that way we have done remarkable amount of work in last uh, seven, eight years in terms of reviving this entire journey of cement. Whenever you talk of a cement plant or a steel plant, you know, of course the first thing that comes to our mind is a massive amount of pollution because uh, it burns fossil fuels. And not only that, they are highly dependent on power, which is almost 60% of the cost goes into, into power. In our plant here, uh, this acquisition, it's about it's 100% of captive power plant, it's, it was a thermal power plant. So what we did from day one is to first of all install waste heat recovery system, which is about 150 crores of investment, which gives a huge benefit in terms of bringing down the overall green footprint. Secondly, uh, across the plants, not only here, but across the Dalmia plants, we have been now, we have reached a stage of about 25 to 28% average uh, alternative fuels. When I say alternate fuels, it means it includes municipal waste, in, it includes plastic waste, it includes FMCG waste, and everything that can cannot be disposed of can be burnt in our kilns. And it is not that, that you can just burn them like that. You have to create technologies, you have to create uh, capturing technologies, chlorine and other, fluorine, etc. so that you, know, you, can, you have to spend a lot of money to be able to do this. So to, to reach this footprint of 28% of alternative fuel was a huge, huge step for us because uh, as I said, that the theme that we have taken is that that going green is is sustainable, but is also profitable. So that's that's the part of the entire thing. And and in this time, especially when the fossil fuel prices have taken that steep turn, all our investments that we had made in these technologies actually started uh, giving a huge benefit to us. And uh, what was uh, earlier about thousand rupees per million kilocalorie uh, a coal was 2,900, 2,800 rupees, almost 300% increase, has now helped us because if we are replacing it by 25, 28% of alternative fuels, it makes a huge difference for us and for the consumers as well. Otherwise, the price of cement would have risen by at least 25 to 30% by, by now. So some of these work has happened simultaneously in all the plants that we have, we have created the green solar infrastructure, which is extremely critical for running the plant. So almost on an average now we have 250 megawatt of green and which is solar uh, powered uh, plants which is extremely high investment on this this technology as well so on scope one we have made most of the progress which is uh, bringing down our overall uh, fossil fuel using alternative fuels uh, then bringing in the energy saving ep energy productivity technologies etc but now our focus is on the logistics part so coming to the logistics part i think that's the most crucial one I'm happy to say we have started making and taking some big steps in this direction. The first one that we took is this Monday. We have started the first fleet of LNG trucks. Uh, Aram was talking about that. Why LNG? Because uh, we have seen that it has 30% lesser uh, CO2 emissions compared to normal trucking. 
uh, it has now started giving us higher lead distances as well as uh, you know uh, a big benefit on our costing as well and we are also now working on the ev if cement is successfully able to be transported by electric vehicles which is still the technology under development i think this can bring down the overall uh, footprint of the overall country i think to a substantial level as i understand uh, transport is about 14% contribution to greenhouse gases which is very high and 90% of that comes from heavy vehicles not from the typical cars and other things that we keep blaming to in delhi and all it's not such a high level of pollution but it's through the heavy trucking that happens so i think uh, this can another be a big game changer and the third one is of course the hydrogen technology which is still under formulation government has uh, allocated 20000 crores this year's budget if this technology comes in picture it will not only help uh, the the vehicle movement per se but even in our plant technologies the carbon capturing and hydrogen uh, technologies which is being developed in sweden can dramatically change the way the cement is produced itself so uh, we are working uh, very aggressively on this topic as well so overall holistically i would say uh, we are all set to you know uh, transform the logistics for the cement industry and i'm sure uh, this is going to lead us to a very big uh, level of savings very good and i think uh, that tells us about uh, growth sustainability uh, going hand hand in hand so a few few points which i want the panelists to kind of uh, address as we uh, go ahead one is uh, when you go through a difficulty in terms of your business is going through a difficult patch at that point in time how do you kind of convince your board how do you convince your other stakeholders to invest uh, in sustainable technologies and, and is there something that uh, you did to kind of get this buy in because finally without that i'm sure you would not have been able to do all these investments which have now starting to bear fruit so is there something on that that you would like to share uh, so let me take up this question suresh uh, there were times you know 5 to 10 years back when it was very tough to uh, justify some of these technologies on roi and typical payback uh, periods but now it's very clear uh, roi you know for for example uh, if i have to justify a waste heat recovery system which is costing us 150 crores my power cost goes down from 9 rupees per unit which is typically bought, bought out power to about 6 and 1/2 rupees it's a 2 and 1/2 rupees per unit advantage and in a plant where I use 100 rupees, uh, 100, 100 units of power per ton of production, it's almost, you know, 100 into 250, 250 rupees per ton impact on my overall, which is not even one and a half years payback. Okay. Similarly for solar, similarly for other items, I think it is tremendous uh, recoveries. So these days it's much more easier, but there are still technologies which are under development like hydrogen where you cannot define and justify it on the basis of uh, uh, you know the current ROIs and paybacks and I think that there is it is in these areas where government support is required to some extent there's a green credit system which has also been proposed I'm sure it's going to give a lot of benefit to the industry to promote these technologies. Thank you and Arham I just wanted to ask you uh, about how uh, you, you kind of talked about in our conversation about mixing B2B and B2C uh, businesses right. with a view to increase asset utilization of the trucks that you have. So how did you manage to do that and what was the thoughts uh, that went behind that? Uh, so we started off with the uh, uh, B2C, you know, for us, uh, you know, internally we call it as a core model. And uh, for us, B2C uh, doesn't restrict to catering to just individuals but small medium businesses as well and the reason we have uh, sort of uh, classified them under b2c is majorly most of the smes and individuals they would have their ad hoc movements uh, i mean like ad hoc movements are the ones which are on demand you know where there are no fixed scheduled movements for them uh, you know uh, it changes according to their kind of growth or whatever the raw material they need the kind of finished product they may sort of wants to deliver so all of those things when we started this, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, the model, one of the things we understood from the supply point that, you know, uh, if we have to cater to fleet owner, 95% of the market, uh, you know, they would not be able to kind of come onto a model which is ad hoc in nature. While, uh, because uh, a fleet owner uh, is a business owner who has fixed cost involved where uh, they do have to pay monthly installments, uh, you know, of the loans that they have taken for the vehicles, uh, the insurance payments, overhead expenses. So 
a fleet owner always look out for a sustainable business which ad hoc wasn't be, wasn't able to kind of uh, provide and that's why few companies who have tried out that model wasn't able to kind of scale it well because uh, they were looking out for minimum guarantees and that's where we sort of figured out how can we kind of you know club the scheduled movements with the ad hoc movements uh, from the vendor side to kind of you know increase the asset utilization of trucks uh, which is currently as i've mentioned is less than 50% uh, to uh, 60, 70, 80 percent, where we'll be able to increase the revenue for the fleet owner per trip per truck, as well as you know uh, reduce the freight to uh, end customers. And this way, we'll be able to kind of bring down the cost of logistics in India. So that's where we started off, uh, you know, B two B vertical as well, where we are catering to uh, you know supply chain companies, B two B procurement companies, e commerce, quick commerce like Zepto, Swiggy. Amazon, Flipkart, uh, Dehat, Moglex of business. And you know, they particularly have a lot of fixed moments involved. So the acquisition of the fleet owner comes through the scheduled moments and, and they are time bound moments. So whenever the asset gets free, we place the same asset uh, to the B2C model for the ad hoc moments. This way we are able to kind of uh, increase the asset utilization for the vehicle, uh, uh, you know, and this way the fleet owner also kind of becomes happy because he do gets the fixed payments from the scheduled movement, which is, uh, you know, generally a year long contract. Uh, at times it's more than a year as well, which is two to three years. And then they make money on the top of it using the ad hoc movements, which is 100% uh, sort of related to their drive of making money where they can replace the drivers even after 12 hours and they can still kind of you know get the loads. So that is how we have clubbed these two models where the idea is to kind of you know empower the fleet owners and this is something that we are trying to do it uh, not just in intra-city but inter-city as well where uh, over there uh, we are trying to kind of help them out to get the return load through technology. Uh, so we have been backed by Microsoft and we have developed uh, you know uh, one of the solutions where we are able to kind of you know map the return trucks coming into any city with the customers who are looking out for trucks in that city according to multiple factors like you know there are so many factors when it comes to truck uh, uh, tonnage is an issue uh, timing uh, body type and so on and so forth location and uh, so so that's what we have been able to kind of you know uh, create a uh, AI ML system which will help us to kind of predict with around 60 to 65 percent accuracy as of now that which truck should match which customer so that uh, you know two metrics can be solved the key K KPIs that we look into one is how can we reduce the wastage of kilometers without freight and secondly how our fleet owner can make more money out of that trip so that is Rishi how we are solving this problem thank you thank you for that and during our conversation Sanjay kind of reminded us saying that in an ESG sustainability conversation, it is but natural to tend towards carbon emission and things like that. And you reminded us that the conversation is never complete if we don't get into aspects like health, safety, and also human rights. And there are a few things around health and safety which Skoda does and the kind of technology that they bring in. And it was very interesting for me to listen to things like connected vehicles. And then I think uh, if you could just tell us some of the work which is happening on that. Yeah, thing. so I represent Volkswagen Group. Volkswagen Group is the uh, world's largest uh, group on automotives with brands like Volkswagen, Skoda, Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini, Bugatti, Ducati. But in the trucking space, we've got Scania and Maan. These two big brands are there. And Scania is a Swedish company. And we do have those technologies getting developed where there are connected cars. So maybe, for example, there are 10 vehicles moving on the road, but they're all connected together. Only the first one is getting driven by the person, and all the other vehicles are electrically, electronically connected to each other, and they're moving. So, uh, for example, I'll take example from the manufacturing industry. Way back from what the way industry started happening, way back in the industrial age of 1800s and early 1900s to 1950s, 60s. 1980s was when the robotic revolution started and all the manufacturing slowly started shifting to robotics. I, way I remember way back I, when I entered the industrial shop floor after graduation from IIT in Maruti Suzuki, it was on the well shop shop floor. It was largely humans and just four robots were there. At the time I left that company, I think there were more than 400 robots over there. Because of this level of automation, it took away the dirty job, it took away the dangerous job, it took away the repetitive job, it took away the boring job, it took away the unergonomic job. 
and those jobs were replaced by much more value added jobs and what we are talking to be today chat gpt and such things so automation is a must to happen and we must take really advantage of this today's jet semi autonomous and autonomous cars are under development trucking is under development uh things like adas uh, automatic driver assistance systems are under development this already come into the cars it has come so all these technologies have to come to the trucks because see a uh, physical movement of a truck happen from happens from a city a to city b why do we need to really put a human being on a boring job of just driving a car on a monotonous road how can we take this job of boring job out of him and put him into something much more value added Uh, so this is something to be thought about that how we really bring in those technologies obviously those technologies are not yet not yet ready and cost effective to be i mean used everywhere but i just I was very happy to see a few days back and ad from tata motors that they have on their trucks put the anti collision devices it shows that two drivers are driving sunday driver starts telling about are ye dekho mera gaon aane wala hai kaun sa wo dekho mera gaon mein wo ghar safed wala hai sare safed ghar hain wo sabse safed wala and his attention was towards that house and suddenly his trucks stops because there was a truck in the front and this was an automatic collision device which was there to prevent it so all these devices need to be put our industrial shop floors today modern are very very advanced now with the industry 4.0 and something i think all these technologies need to come to trucking space i think truck netics is doing a wonderful job arham has got lot of bright ideas he's a stanford graduate and i think he's bringing in all this thought process i hope sure it will all come to the country secondly is about uh, if i say what i am doing in the manufacturing industry the four areas to work upon decarbonization circular economy but two more very important and they are the social aspects one is health and safety and second is about the human rights so this area of uh, trucking uh, or whatever logistics we have got even the last mile delivery systems even zomato and all these people they are very very unorganized sectors people don't have any insurance i don't know whether person who was delivering food to me whether he himself had food or not so it's very very important to take care of this bottom of the pyramid they are the geese who are giving us the golden eggs are they really getting taken care or not we have to take care uh, having insurance is all right are they trained enough to drive a truck i mean i'm a cyclist and i start very early in the morning 5 o'clock and i'm really afraid to drive alone because you know the truckers there must be some 14 year or 15 year old person who's driving over there who doesn't have a formal training he got his license imported from manipur and is driving over here sleeping so this is another big area of ensuring that they are really skilled and really competent enough to operate all these areas are really important to work upon their human rights part i'll also count one story i'm this was around 2011 or 12 i was in my earlier company a truck had come to us in the morning uh, at around 8 uh, o'clock and it was to enter inside at 9 o'clock on the gate the security guard said to the uh, cleaner person please get down you are not wearing a safety shoe so driver alone went inside and went to the warehouse to park his truck it was a big huge truck carrying the spare parts and this guy was trying to reverse the truck and put it in the uh, right row right bay no bay was not designed properly it had a pillar over there and this person while reversing had his head out and trying to see backwards and while reversing his head collided with the pillar and i saw the person standing over there head bleeding and the person died on the spot and after that lot many complications happened uh, the parents and the wife nobody was really i mean everybody was after the money what compensation who will get it was all very dirty story but reason was that this person was not having enough sleep for the last 3 days his uh, the journey management or his uh, contract management was about that okay from bangalore if you reach gurgaon in 3 days time we will get 15000 rupees extra this guy had not slept for the last 3 days so all these things are very very important how do we manage a vehicle is the vehicle safe is a driver safe does it have enough uh, what to call spare people over there to take care of him take care of driving full utilization of the road after 8 hours of sleep i remember i was in europe uh, of couple of three four years back just before covid and we had a bus who was taking us all around the europe and that person one day we had to late in the night to reach a place somewhere in switzerland next day morning this guy refused to start before 10 am he said nothing doing if i log in before it i'll be my license will be taken away because everything was electronically controlled as soon as he logs in with his card in the bus 
in the bus, his time starts, but if he starts beforehand, he'll immediately get a warning, no, you cannot drive. So really, we have to think about those aspects, human rights aspects, whether people are getting right wages, all these times of working hours, safeties, these are very, very important to build up. Thank you. Thank you for completing that, that aspect <coughs> of uh, ESG for us. And there is this question about methane and some of the work which uh, Bayer is doing about it. Maybe if you could talk about it and then we can throw open for questions. Sure. Thanks for this question. This is very, very important for uh, all of uh, the uh, colleagues sitting here, friends sitting here, because agriculture may be a new area for them. So, uh, like we are, uh, Bayer internally uh, committed to the smart climate, basically. And uh, on the SBT targets, we are uh, committed to reduce one, uh, the 1 1.5 degree warming. Second, uh, that we took the initiative that uh, by 2020, it would be neutral carbon company across. And uh, very important that our all compensation up to executive level, all the employees are tied with the sustainability initiatives. Coming to Ethan, uh, basically, uh, Bayer uh, took the lead across the world and India also started in 2021 itself that uh, we will go with the rice uh, crop where which is the highest uh, input uh, asking crop as well as the water asking crop. So that way we selected the rice crop and this is the staple food across India farmers and Bayer food prints are also in 3.4 million farmers. That way we selected this crop and this is the crop which is uh, releasing highest carbon and methane together and uh, which is the highest and followed by the wheat and then the maize then other crops. So uh, we are expecting that uh, by uh, reducing the 25% of water uses from this crop and optimizing the fertilizer uses and uh, uh, crop protection products uses that way and also the water management activity. By taking the new practice in the field like uh, I don't know, uh, like you guys are uh, well versed or not, uh, for the paddy crop, we have to go for the transplanting method, where nursery is ready and after 30 days it has to be transplanted. That is con consuming huge water. And uh, Bayer as a company has suggested and uh, now uh, like uh, advocating across uh, uh, to the farming community that why not to go with the direct sowing. Direct sowing will escape the transplanting method Definitely there would be uh, like some uh, yield dent, but uh, same time by uh, having a optimized fertilizer, crop protection and water consumption, we can even increase the profitability of the farmers. That way this uh, combination promotion is going on. In 21, we took the target and uh, we found that not only 25% of the uh, water consumption decreased, but same time we increased the farmer incomes by 10%. And uh, this was the initiative for 3,000 hectares. And uh, uh, we found that the farmer's livelihood uh, also improved and the knowledge towards the new technology, new package and practices towards rice cropping also increased very, very significantly. And now we are expecting by 2030, uh, we would be a neutral carbon company across the world. That way we are going ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is something completely new that I picked up yesterday and I'm sure for many of you also it would have been new hearing about this single straight sowing of paddy instead of transplanting which is a traditional method. I hope we hear more about it. So we've got about five, seven minutes uh, uh, left uh, open to the audience for questions to anyone on the panel. Hi, sir. I am... Uh Lalit Nuwanti from All Cargo. I report on to Mr. Suresh, uh, <laughs> the moderator of today's. That's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, about a year back, uh, I stumbled upon a documentary by DW TV, the German TV. Uh, the documentary was about 40 minutes uh, length, and it was called "How Green Is the Green Energy." It talked about the rare earth metals that is being uh, mined at a faster, much faster rate to produce electric batteries and how it is killing the farming. So my question to uh, Das Auto, Mr. Sanjay Khare, sir, is it correct that uh, we are killing farming and uh, utilizing the groundwater at a much faster rate by producing the electric uh, batteries to run the cars? Sir, you are 
I'll not say whether you're right or you're wrong. I'll divert this topic to a word called life cycle thinking, LCE, life cycle engineering. I think this is one topic which should be taught into every engineering college or schools or science classes. This is all about whatever we are doing today. For example, in 1853, the first train moved from Bombay VT. It was called Bori Bandar that point of time. Bori means cotton Bori and Bandar was a harbor from here to Thane. 35 minutes, a train carrying 400 people, beast of an engine removing it. Everybody was very happy that economy has moved forward and this place has become monetary capital. But they all forgot that it was being run on coal and what effect it can have on intergenerational and intragenerational conflicts. So I think this needs to be seen into every aspect we are doing, whether we're doing automation, modernization, or bringing new technologies, bringing new ways of agriculture, bringing new ways of generating energy, materials, cements. So this is a very, very debatable topic, whether it's good or bad, but there's a full science behind it. How exactly we measure the environmental impacts, ocean edification potential, ozone depletion potential, lot of parameters are calculated on each and every aspect of it from mining or from resource extraction, what it can have effect on the social part of it, on the people part, if you use the word child labor or farming, even today's day people are talking, even farming is not good. It takes away the biodiversity away because today's day there are three major challenges. One is climate change, which is leading to global warming. Second is about loss and biodiversity loss because the earth is limited and every economy is dependent upon the natural resources. And third is causing the inequalities. So I'll not put anything yes or no to what you have said, but yes, what you said is a possibility. So you have to see the details of it in much more details, what impact my life cycle engineering can have on the cost today and tomorrow, impacts on environment and society today and tomorrow. What you, can, what you have said can be true and cannot be true also. But uh, what my company has done, because you asked a question to Dasato, or Dasato was earlier named Volkswagen, we have done a detailed life cycle engineering on this topic in the entire value chain which I talked about. We intend to have a carbon neutral handover of the car to the customers. That means whatever amount of uh, resource extraction till I have made the car, whatever amount of carbon credits or equivalent, it's not just around carbon, but any time of wastage can be equivalent to be CO2 equivalent that has been equated to zero, either by reducing, by using yeah. renewable energy, or if we have not been able to do, how to compensate it in the, by in the form of carbon credits or reforestation. After that, during the use phase, whatever energy is getting used, how that energy is a green energy ensuring that, and then end of life is all about designing a car which is recyclable in design. So this whole process is certainly in the thought process, and not just thought process, in the actions also, we are working in a big way on using green products inside the car interiors today. For example, our new Skoda Enyaq has got seats, which is totally made up of recycled plastic bottles, like the sped bottles. Or the interiors, the dyeing is under the coffee beans. The thought processes are there. Electric vehicle as compared to an IC engine or a hydrogen engine is the most efficient one for the same amount of en energy that goes inside and output comes out is much more than that. That way it's much more efficient, but uh, what you have said, does have certain amount of truth, no doubt about it. Thank you, thank you, sir. Hello, I, I'm Ravindra, basically. I'm uh, uh, taking care of the global sourcing and supply of you know, a plant and machinery for engineering uh, clients of mine. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, which is being uh, uh, passed by the German government, and I believe other uh, members of the EU will uh, follow, uh, which takes care of uh, the sustainability, the uh, unethical trade practices in, in the supply chain, pollution and other, you know, child labor, everything. So anything similar that is being, uh, um, you know, um, because a lot of uh, incidences, uh, Sanjayji mentioned about accidents and, and the health issues, uh, which we could address the Indian, uh, you know, uh, uh, logistic and supply chain sector. Anything on similar lines as far as, you know, act is concerned. Since it's uh, directed to any one specific. I mean, Sanjay ji and Sanjay probably, uh, you know, Suresh ji can. Suresh ji would like to take it first. Uh, 
Sir, what you have said is a wonderful question. Uh, as far as I think there's one topic I think which we are dis discussing yesterday, we have not discussed today. Uh, it was called inside out or outside in. So the time we are doing something inside out, like an egg, when, when it's broken from inside, a new life is born. But if you break it from outside, it becomes an omelet. Somebody eats it. Going against the nature, yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say. So sustainability, today's yet, if you say it should be all about how do we do it inside out? How do we work on our own? How do we don't kill that golden goose? It should be all about that. It should not be about regulations. Because regulations coming, LKSG norms coming, your German due diligence act you're talking about, there are a number of ways how to bypass those regulations. We all know in India that how we can bypass regulations. I'm not uh, here to say. If I ask somebody to give a self-certification, you always say everything is good. I worked for Japanese organizations for a very, very long time, 28 years. We were never taking any certifications. They are simply writing up on a piece of paper, forgetting piece of paper, just saying one, one statement. My place is really taking care of emissions in a 100% way. I took a lot of learnings from them, from them way back in 1993, not today, almost 30 years back. That was my first visit over there. I was on training from Japanese government at that point of time. I visited a number of corporations over there. I'm talking 30 years back. Everywhere, I found one thing about their purpose. You know, what's the purpose of an industry? They were talking it first. Purpose was to build a better society, to build a better place, to build a better country. Everybody defined it like this, whether Toyota or Komatsu or Casio or Hitachi, wherever I went. Number two, at the entrance of the manufacturing plant, very vacant, they had a big water pond full of ducks and beautiful fishes. And that was the recycled water of the plant. So that was the level of inside out demonstrations. So that is what is the culture we need to bring. I think we are all working in the responsible positions over here, whether on this side of the table or that side of the table. And we can all bring it, at least if nothing else, in our own personal work or in our circle of our direct reportees or in our circles of our wherever the concern lies, that these commitments can come. I said they start with the commitment. This is the year of B20. I start with the commitment that in my area, at least I'll take care about it. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I just I wanted to add uh, uh, in that the, the way Bayer works. Uh, as a responsible company, uh, we have uh, zero child labor programs across the production sites across the world. And that way we are living with. And second, uh, we have, you know, uh, Based on the toxicity classification, we have removed all red uh, classification uh, category products out from our business. Though it was a loss of thousands of crores, but we support the environment, we support the society in a big way. That way we have uh, committed to the society and taken the initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, this uh, whistleblower mechanism in the organizations, also, this uh, system for ethics and compliance in the organizations have to be much more stronger. We have got a very strong system covered straight away from Volkswagen Germany. Anybody in the organization can raise a voice. If there is somebody who's uh, hiding an accident, somebody is doing an emission, somebody using a wrong chemical, person is, has to get out of the door immediately. So these regulations have to be very tough, no doubt about it. Well, ultimately, we know in India or Singapore, if there's no red light or person monitoring you, person will jump the red light. So that regulations are important to have. Uh, I am Devdath from Tata Consulting Engineers. I head the maritime business, also some portion of the energy transition and green shipping. My question here to Mr. Hakim is, we were talking about this hydrogen hub. And as you know, the minister has announced that three ports, Kandla, Paradip, and Tutikorin, will go for hydrogen hub. First question is, on what basis these ports were decided? Neither the logistics or the port where I belong to was consulted. My apprehension is there should be a cluster of ports which should go for this hub model, like say Mumbai and JNPT and future Wad 1 for the entire, entire hydrogen hub, or Enor, Katupalli, and uh, uh, Chennai. So uh, de uh, declaring one port I don't know what is the basis of it. We need to actually deliberate on these kind of declarations which has come, number one point. Number two point, when this hydrogen hub comes, if you see the entry model or the Rotterdam model, they have gone for a hub or a pipeline system for this. And also the next generation district where the incubation, plug and play, and what you rightly told that recycling, reuse. 
even the tires of um, uh, Volkswagen and other vehicles, they are boulder-like companies who are doing this kind of recycling. So without this thought process, we are announcing this kind of policies. So I would like to know that we should jointly represent for the ports which should, where it should actually happen, and it should be copied to the entire port ecosystem. You cannot make only the port green. It has to be all companies in the port who are using this ecosystem has to go green. So what is your response on that? So uh, very honestly, um, I don't understand fully the context of your question because uh, these, uh, because I was talking in terms of the in the context of the development of the hydrogen technologies, the carbon capturing and hydrogen technologies. But on the on the hubs part, honestly speaking, I am not very uh, sure of on what basis they have designed it. But I understand, I think uh, the the amount of uh, study and extent of work which is required, we can surely talk offline on this topic and understand. And through CIA also we can represent and we can take it up with the government. On the second part, I think uh, I would certainly like to address that, which is uh, this trying to create hubs for the recycled products, which can be then used in the industries, which are large consumer industries. And that is one area where I think we are massively lacking, for sure. Uh, because the generation uh, hubs are different and consumption hubs are completely different. And the largest uh, consumption industries today for these alternative fuels are cement, are steel, but they are not also the generation hubs. For example, Chandrapur cluster, where uh, you know the 50 percent or 70 percent of the cement of Maharashtra and Telangana and others are is, is manufactured there. There is hardly any generation there. So the biggest challenge that today we face is the consolidation of all these type of products, sorting of these products, and getting it to our plants. Because the cost of the product itself is actually negative many a times. But it's the freight cost which is far more than the, the bringing it to, to our site. And that's where the, the biggest challenge lies. It's true with fly ash, it's true with uh, rubber, plastics, uh, polymers, all kinds of waste which is there. The worst part is that, uh, and which is far more complex and we have actually represented to the government on this one, is the, the pollution norms. Uh, and it's not to do with the pollution norms, it's to do with the consolidation norms. They are not allowing us to buy these products directly from the companies. So they have purposefully introduced intermediaries who are supposed to be so-called, you know, uh, torch bearers or, or consolidators or bringing it together and then, uh, and, and then sort of, uh, you know, between the hazardous and non-hazardous segregations, etc. But uh, actually speaking, it's not happening. It's just... Uh, there are some intermediaries who are ending up as, as a major money-making machines which will ultimately make those products completely unviable for the industries to be used. That's why we are currently fighting with the government that if we are allowed to buy directly, we are responsible enough to understand. We have put all the norms, all the control norms on our plants. The plants are open for audits. You can see, you know, what we are trying to do. And only then it can happen, otherwise it, it will not happen. So I think that's one major area of bottleneck which is... Uh, you know, keeping us away. I think we are well past our time, and uh, we will call the session to a close. But before uh, winding up, uh, a huge thanks to the audience for being such patient listeners and for your searching questions to the panel. And of course to the panel uh, from whom personally I've learned so much, and I'm sure that all of you also carry a lot of good insights. Uh, please give the panel a round of applause. Uh, I've got one request over here. Uh, this is the year of G20, B20, India's leadership, India's credibility on the topic, and I think our Prime Minister is working hard on this topic for all of us to take a pledge in our respective areas that we'll commit to climate change. There's a CIS Climate Action Charter where we can all sign and get onto that, because everything starts with the commitment and then the actions yeah. will happen. Do take that. I do advocate a lot of it on my LinkedIn profile, so you can always join that, and uh, please work on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, uh, with a, with a strong commitment to taking all these initiatives forward. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the CIA Western Region for organizing this. Thank you very much.